Hi everyone, welcome to Pankind's Empowered webinar, Adjusting to a Pancreatic Cancer Diagnosis. My name is Sophia Casbolt and I'm Pankind's Program Manager. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Now I've just got a little bit of housekeeping before we start. I need to let you know that the information presented in these webinars is of a general nature and should not be considered personal or medical advice. Always seek independent advice relevant to your specific situation. The opinions of the presenters are their own and do not necessarily reflect the views of Pankind. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties during the webinar, please do let us know via the Q&A bar on the right of your screen or you can email me at sophia at pankind.org.au. A recording of the webinar will be available from our website and only those presenting on screen will be in the recording. During this webinar, attendees' mics and cameras will be off. So today's webinar will be presented by Shannon Brown, who will discuss strategies to help adjust to a pancreatic cancer diagnosis. This will include strategies to critically reflect on your own experience and adjustment, strategies to feel empowered to collaborate and advocate with your treating teams, practical information and education about the support available, parallel planning with supportive care, and how to facilitate discussions with family about the experience of adjustment. This will be followed by a Q&A, and please send through your questions at any time via the Q&A panel on the right of your screen. And if a question comes through that you would also like answered, you can upvote it in the chat. Questions most relevant to today's topic or more general in nature will be prioritized. So if you've got any questions specific to your circumstances, these are really best directed to your healthcare team. And now I would like to introduce our wonderful presenter for today, Shannon Brown. Shannon is a senior social worker in the Sydney Local Health District. She's currently working in a secondment role at the GP Can Share Palliative Care Social Worker. Prior to this, Shannon was the upper GI, colorectal and pelvic mesh social worker at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. Her passion remains supporting patients and families from new diagnosis and treatment to life-limiting prognosis, focusing on clear, compassionate communication. Welcome, Shannon, and thank you so much for presenting today. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for everyone being here tonight. It's a little strange that I don't get to see all your lovely faces, um, but please definitely put through any questions um, as they come out throughout the presentation and we can get to them at the end. I guess to start off is that this is a journey that no one expects and it changes so many significant things for yourself and your families and your many communities. Um, I was saying to Sophia before this that what I'm speaking about to you today is not necessarily something that I've learned, but it's often been passed on by patients who I've worked with over the years that have gone through the pancreatic cancer journey. And it's a thing they've discussed with me and it's often the many lessons they've, they've also taught me along the way. So I guess just to get Oh, Shannon, just to let you know, you've muted yourself. Are we back? Sorry, guys, I hit the enter and not the slide. Um, um, just to start off, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands on which we meet today um, and the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people participating in the webinar. I pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging and recognise and celebrate that diverse of Aboriginal peoples and their ongoing cultures and connections to land and waters. So I guess just starting out is where does it impact? Well, pancreatic cancer and a diagnosis of it for a family member or yourself impacts every part of your life. But this evening, I thought I just would speak to a couple of the main areas that will come up. Firstly, emotionally um, is probably one of the most significant ones, and it's the hardest one to articulate often. Uh, outside of that is the practical things that it impacts, our employment, our work, you know, all of those basic needs that we require to support ourselves. It can impact our faith, our spirituality, socially, our community, our relationships with others and our life course and what we perceived it to be. So before we get too far when we talk about adjusting, it's about understanding what our coping strategies are. 
So let's start very from the beginning before pancreatic cancer became part of your journey or part of your loved one's journey. What's your necessarily your coping strategies? So I think everyone just take a moment and have a little bit of a think about how they focus on things. Are you a type of person that if you're under a really stressful pressure situation or something goes astray, are you a person that becomes emotional or upset or angry and is that how you cope or are you a person that becomes hyper problem focused and you're going to look for that solution and you're going to work towards it and solve it are you a person that sources out meaning or tries to find an answer as to why it happened is that where you inherently go do you, are you a type of person that seeks socially um, to access support through others and talking about what's going on and talking through those matters are you a person that avoids it, uh, talking about it, doing it, pulling the rug over, you know, all of those things? And so I guess starting out, it's really good to have an understanding of what your coping strategies are. And I guess also those of who your main support people are in your life, whether that is your partner or a friend or another family member who's that. How do they cope? Because they're going to be on this journey with you and their coping styles will equally have an impact as well. I guess starting out with coping styles and when we talk, it can often be done in quite negative commentations, but your coping styles and the strategies that you use and have already used over your life are there to protect yourself. It's when you feel under threat or something is so overwhelming has happened. So they shouldn't be perceived as a negative, but it's really good to have a grasp and an understanding of how your coping strategies impact your experience and how you seek out whatever support you may need. It also gives us a benefit of understanding what our partners may be. If they have an more avoidant style, we understand that if this situation and cancer comes into the picture, that those features and how they've, you know, dealt with things along the way might similarly come up as we move forward. So I'm just going to take a few moments to pause and get you to have a think about whether or not you want to scribble down because um, we might touch on these kind of throughout the rest of the presentation. Here's the thing we don't talk about, <laughs> and I would say it's one of the most important things, is the diagnosis. And I've had so many patients along the way reflect upon and tell me about how their experience of their diagnosis impacts them moving forward. You know, it, it sets this pretense of how you experience not only the rest of the journey, the stress, the distress of it, but also how you have your relationship with your treating team or your healthcare providers because they're usually the ones providing you with that information. So firstly, just taking a step back is having a think about how you were told. Did you feel prepared for the information? Did they give you time? Were you able to ask questions? Did they sit down? Did they give you that space? Were you able to have someone with you at the time? And, you know, more often than not, it can be done as you're in a hospital ward and you've come in for tests or it could be done in a rooms or it can be done in many different places. And your experience and your reflection on how you felt that event to be is really significant. And we often don't talk about it enough. I've had patients say that it was really distressing and how it was told to them. I've had others that have described that they felt supported and they were able to ask questions. Um, I've had others who were able to ask for a family member to be present. And all of those things are really important. I guess just taking that first step moving forward. After diagnosis comes all the questions. And often you're in this significant limbo state and uncertainty about what the next steps are. You might have appointments booked in, you might have further tests booked in or you may be getting discharged with hospital with an upgoing plan of outpatient follow-up. Now, the things that I have come to find is asking yourself whether things are helpful at the time. So I've got here is the internet search. The internet can definitely be a place of many pitfalls. The information isn't necessarily screened. It's not always written in a factual way, and it can be, you know, written in a way to kind of emote certain emotions. So when you go down that rabbit hole of searching in the internet, I think it's sometimes good to pause and say, is this helpful? Is this making me feel more in control? Is this making me feel like I'm getting more information? Or is this making me worry more? Am I worrying further down the track than where I am at this stage? And it's the same with loved ones. You know, when they can't 
do anything but search information and find out and try and be helpful, those searches can be the only thing you can do at that time. But sometimes they're not. And so when you're doing any action, I think it's really wonderful to always just check in with yourself and have a really good understanding of whether it's helpful or not. The other thing is searching for a cause. When you're someone with a coping style which, you know, wants meaning and understanding and you want to grasp the whole reason as to why, you can often go down a similar rabbit hole of searching information as to say, why is this happening for me? What was the cause? Did I do something? Was there another factor? Was there this? And sometimes those line of questions and investigations aren't helpful because you are still in that moment and you are still experiencing the pancreatic cancer journey. You're still receiving treatment. And it's really hard to sometimes be in that space. So if you are, sometimes it is helpful. But it's about checking in and seeing if it is serving you in that moment. Is it serving you as a loved one that's worrying about your person that you care for? Is it serving you as a person who is experiencing it? The other one is why me? And that brings on a whole incredible amount of guilt and questioning. And I think it's a really valid question because out of everyone in the world, why was it my experience this one? And I'm sure you've all found along the way that there is limited information or absolute direct cause that they can provide you along the way to give you that solid answer that gives that reasoning. And I think it's valid to ask, but again, it's about taking a step back and saying, is this serving me? Or is this making me feel guilty? Is this making me question things? Is this making me feel more distressed or increasing my feelings of anxiousness? So all of these reflective practices are really important to ensure that what you are doing is serving you in a way that is going to not is that is going to reduce the amount of distress rather than make it worse. The other thing is hearing stories. I have found that often community members, families, other people will say, well, I've had a friend or I had so-and-so's mum or I read this article. And sometimes they're really wonderful things to hear and they give us hope and they connect us to others that have been on a similar lived experience. But other times they can minimise how your experience is and it can provide more uncertainty. And so checking in and having boundaries on whether hearing all of these stories is helpful is really important. The other thing is people have a habit of saying you look well when you explain to them if it's not something that can necessarily be seen or people aren't perceiving you as ill. They can often say you look really well and that can really sometimes disvalue what you are going through and what you're experiencing and sometimes you just don't want to hear it one more time and so having all of these things happen along the way and questioning if they're helpful for you or not allows you to develop certain boundaries about what your needs are at the time. And these change throughout and they fluctuate day to day and month to month. But it's really good at establishing where you're at and what your boundaries are or what your line is. This is okay for me. This isn't okay for me. I wouldn't like this crossed. That type of thing. Now, looking at when I brought up all the many facets that it can impact in our life, I did just firstly want to touch on emotions. And when we talk about emotions, I think we can kind of get a bit lost in what it is or it can be sometimes a little bit superficial. But emotions are something that you're going to have and what your loved ones and families and communities and children, everyone is going to have an experience of their own and how they experience emotion, how they express emotion, is all going to be part of what you also experience whilst also mediating your own. So when it comes to emotions, I think the most significant ones that can come up that are easily to identify is the sense of feeling overwhelmed. It can be tearfulness. It can be agitated or worried or fearful or angry or feeling helpless and hopeless. And some days, all in one day, you will experience all of those things. And it can be an incredible, exhausting wave that you're on. My big thing that I always say is that seeing emotion, having fluctuations in emotion is often a reassuring feature. It worries me when you come in and things are persistent and that includes being really high and so positive and up to here brimming every single day and it also means when you're feeling low and feeling like unmotivated motivated and feeling very hopeless at that time. 
the things when emotions get to a point that they're worrisome is when they're persistent. It's when that they're not on that wave. You're not getting the ups and then a slight down. Or, you know, if you've had a really bad day of treatment or you've had a d- discussion with the doctor that provided news that was really worrisome and distressing, you know, and understandably your mood shifted in associated with that. So what I thought is I just put down some points about just kind of as another check-in with yourself about, you know, how am I going along or how is, you know, if you're a support person, um, also what you're thinking. So the first thing is persistence. I would say if you've had a couple of days, then that's okay. But if it's any more than a couple of days, I'd be really reaching out for support or asking or bringing up to your doctors or your allied health or whoever is part of your caring team, your nursing staff, and saying, you know, I've noticed for the last little bit or I've noticed my partner for the last little bit is feeling this way. I think if you have a constant feeling of overwhelmed and being hopeless and feeling very helpless in the situation, that emotion to me indicates there's other things going on. It could be that there's a overwhelming sense of practical things that need to be supported. There may be big decisions that need to be made in regards to your treatment. So for me, that is the point at which you seek that support and often it can be mediated and worked through or at least navigated some of it. If you're spending a great deal of time worrying, and I think this kind of links back to when I was speaking before about often a lot of the internet searches and the different things that we do, if that is fostering an incredible amount of worry about things that are, you know, present, future, you know, every possible A, B, C avenue could be going down, that's the time about really being able to access support and the accessing support, I would say, is not going to take the worrying away, but it's about navigating it and containing it to a place where it is not incredibly overwhelming or distressing because distress and that sense of dread and fear is a terrible place to be. Um, the other thing to touch on is if, you know, you've noticed any changes in sort of any sort of substance use or alcohol, if it's increased, things like that, you know, it's they're always really good indicators of how you are going emotionally and when it's time to just Bring it up in a conversation and see where support is available. I think some of these other things I'm going to touch on is isolating from people and activities. I think as a blanket thing, that is a really good indicator. But if you're unwell and you've got really terrible symptoms and you feel really dreadful, then you're not going to want to see people and you're not going to want to do activities. So it's about being reasonable in your understanding of where you're at at that situation. I would say if there's been any unusual fluctuations in mood, especially if it's towards maybe irritation and anger and things like that, um, as well as just keeping up with daily tasks. And it's not about, you know, going to work every day or making sure all the washing's on the line and things like that. It's the most basic tasks about feeling if you can get out of bed. It's feeling like you can have a shower. And it's about that persistence that that's happened over multiple days. And sometimes that's in the context of symptoms and being unwell. So it's all those things we need to look at. But I would say if you've got a gut instinct and you're feeling like things are changing and you're not sure and you've got that sense of uncertainty, use your team as a bit of a bounce board as in a check-in and be like, I wasn't sure about this. What's your thoughts? This is how I'm feeling at the moment. This is what I've noticed. So this is kind of where I'm working through to the point is how do we talk about it? I should say that none of us have give, been given any lessons. I'm probably still, as much as I talk about it with patients and families, I'm still not the expert of it. But these are my tips about how you start. And this is this time to talk in these different strategies is about supporting conversations with your support people and your loved ones and your partners and your family and your children. And so I'm talking about this from a patient's perspective of how I would approach that conversation or initiate it. And I would say there are times when you need to initiate those conversations, especially if you, you know, your partner's coping strategies are stressed to maybe withdraw at times, you might be the person that needs to initiate that. Other times you're not the person that wants to talk about it and this might be your role and you need to start to initiate those conversations. So before you even start the chat, there's a couple of things to consider. How do you normally communicate? Before pancreatic cancer was part of your life and your journey and what's going on, how did you and your relationship beforehand communicate? Are you, do you talk really openly? Do you talk about your emotions? Is it something that you usually prepare for? Or is it, you know, just kind of an incidental chat that you have along the way? 
what is your baseline communication styles? Because that's probably going to be how it starts. That's how you relate to each other. That's how you communicate. And so that gives you a really good idea of walking in how it may be. The other thing is preparing people in advance, especially if it's a topic that's quite confronting to talk about. And I think it's always good to kind of be like, I want to touch on this, you know, next tomorrow. And it doesn't have to be a time or a date, but it can preempt them to think and them to be able to gather their thoughts about how they're feeling or going at the moment. The other thing is about why is it important to you to have this conversation? What's it about? Is it about you want to talk about your advanced care planning? Do you want to talk about your fears? Do you want to talk about, you know, what will happen in the future? Or do you want to talk about, you know, the surgery or what happens with that? And the other thing to think about, which is incredibly important, is what are you wanting to gain from this conversation? Do you just want them to listen and feel supported and feel that they have an understanding of what your wishes are? Do you want them to help problem solve what that issue is? Do you want to get their advice? And I think when you walk into that conversation, it's really good to have that understanding about what your wishes are from this. And often it could be checking in and saying like, I don't, for me, I just want to talk about how I'm feeling and I need you to listen at this moment. I want to hear how you're feeling. Or I'd really like, you know, to talk about some strategies of how we could work this out together and what steps we need to take. And all of those things provide a really, really conducive way to having a discussion that means you get something out of it. Now the tough part, the conversation or the chat or the talk or what it may be. It doesn't have to be something big. And I would highly recommend, especially when it's one of those heavier topics, that having a two hour long conversation sometimes isn't conducive. It can be exhausting and depleting both emotionally and physically and mentally and all of those things. So small little bites over time and over week, I think is a really good way to approach it and also reserve and conserve some of those energy levels within yourself. So start small. Talk about maybe one topic that's the most important that you prioritize that time. Or if it's a question or a couple of things to solve, it's about having a couple of those questions. I always would start with, I just wanted to talk to you about this because it is important to me. Or I needed to talk about this because I'm afraid of this. It's really uncomfortable. And I think saying if you're uncomfortable to talk about that particular do topic or you're afraid or you're unsure and things like that, being really vulnerable and being able to situate that in the conversation is a really good way to start that off and be able to talk because they're probably equally as uncomfortable and not sure what to say. They're probably worried they're going to say the wrong thing and things like that. So having that vulnerability and acknowledging where you're at, you know, really sets it up for a way that you both feel comfortable and safe in that space to have that discussion. The next thing is that it's not an interview. I think sitting down at a dinner table looking directly across from each other can be a really confronting chat I would say do a what activity that's within your ability to do so I've suggested you could go for a walk a really light walk around a park you could be cooking you could be doing a puzzle you could even be folding the clothes but doing something so it's not as confronting to sit down and have to that face-to-face -face discussion I think is a really nice way to take that kind of rawness off it at the time so once you've had the chat no matter what it is about, it's really good to check in. Like you could say, you might check in and say, oh, actually, for me, I feel really relieved I was able to have that chat to you. Or that was really hard for me to say. I didn't expect I'd actually open that up that much to you. Or you're just as afraid as I am. You know, those are the type of things to do a check in. It can be with each other, but also you can do it, you know, by yourself. So once you've stepped out of that conversation, if you've walked to the bathroom and you get a couple of minutes of silence to yourself, just check in. Did you get what you needed out of that conversation? Is that it? Did it run how you expected it to go? You know, is there any things that you did want to touch on further? Did you get it all clarified or did you need to be clarified a bit further in future? The other time is, also just acknowledging that you need a check-in again. So it could be making a time to talk further or actually I might touch base with you next week about it or things like that. Or if you want to talk to me more about it, let's do that. The other thing is setting homework, which sounds like a very dreadful concept to bring up is that you need to do some work on it. But 
having some tasks. So if they didn't respond or have any answers at that time, especially maybe with how they're feeling or if the support you need from them, saying, well, that's okay. Like I understand you need some time. If you're a type of person that needs time and processing and then come back to it later, then how about we touch base, you know, on Friday again when you're off work? Or it could be if they've talked about delegating what practical supports are, writing a list of the things and allocating who's going to do what and moving that forward. Or I need you to do these things. Or actually the kids, you need to organise this off my plate now, so can you do that? So setting that homework kind of with each other so everyone knows what each other's expectations of one another are are really important. And this is the thing, unless we talk about expectations and what everyone's doing, then no one knows. Um, And that's why it's really important to make these times to talk and do it in a really do it in a concise way but also do it in a planned way so you know that you're going to get what you need from that and what your expectations are but also that you've been honest with the person other person in that conversation about what you need they might say they're uncomfortable and then you have to mediate around that but at least you both know where you're at the other communication which is incredibly important and we don't talk about it enough is how to talk to your healthcare team And I would say your relationship and how you talk with your healthcare team is really different depending on what stage you're at. So if you're talking to a, you know, a nurse, if you're talking to a surgeon, if you're talking to an oncologist, if you're talking to a palliative care specialist, if you're talking to an allied health like a social worker or you're talking to a psychologist, each of those has a very different communication style. And I think what we forget is that it's your body it's your life and in part of that is advocating about what your needs are and at times that means you need to be assertive that means that you have to have someone with you to be assertive on your behalf but it's also sharing about what your expectations are in the communication and again it comes back to that concept of expectations of one another are never matched if we don't talk about it so i guess the first thing is questions Questions are incredibly important. And if you get in that consult room with that doctor, if you haven't written them down, you are going to forget them because there'll be so much ever going on and they'll be leading what questions they need to know to best support you and your care. But what you can do is have those questions at the end. And what I would do when you walk first into the room with the doctor and say, I've got a couple of questions. If it's okay, I'd like to touch on that at the end before we finish the appointment. The other thing is if you don't understand, say it. Believe me, I've worked in health this long and I still don't understand some of the things they say or I don't understand the certain procedures to the preciseness of what they say and say, oh, excuse me, I didn't understand. Can you just explain that again? And it doesn't mean that they're going to, you know, think any differently of you, but it's very important you have a comprehensive understanding of what's going on, what implications could be, what other supports are available, what's going on. You need to feel like you have a really good understanding of what that conversation was to the point that you might be able to repeat it another time. The other thing is advocating. Advocating for yourself and what your wishes are. There are times when you're going to need to say, actually, I need this, or this is where I'm at today, or this is how I'm feeling. And they're the times where you're going to have to speak up. And it takes an astronomical amount of courage to do that. And I would say in the times where you don't feel like you can, then pass that ballot to the next person, pass it to your support person and say, I need you. If I'm not saying it in this thing, I need you to stand up for me and say it. The other thing is share. I think we don't share enough about what's important or who we are. And I'll give you a bit of an example about sharing. So sometimes they can be talking about all different medications and tablets and things like that. And you'll be like, oh, I don't want to take medications. And rather than say, I don't want to take medications, you'd be best to share, well, actually, I haven't ever had to take medications before in my life. And I'm finding it really hard taking so many now. And I don't know what to do about that. But is there some way you can help me? Because it's actually, it really sits uncomfortably with me can we work on this together? Or actually, I've been a really, really active person my whole entire life and my fatigue is really bad and that's actually bothering me the most because it doesn't make me feel like me. And so sharing those pieces about what is important to you, who you are and why it is, gives a really good understanding of, you know, what support's needed, how they can best support you in those things. The other thing, as I mentioned briefly before, is to take a support person. 
I know sometimes it's really difficult if they're working and things like that. You can ask them to be put on speakerphone if you'd like them to be present in the consultation. They couldn't come in in person. It's about having someone else there to listen and hear as well. And it means that you can, after the appointment, you have someone to bounce off what happened. You know, was this what, how it was said or was that? It's a really good kind of reflection touch point. The other thing is articulating your feelings. I would say there are times when you probably haven't felt heard or you haven't felt listened to. And it's about saying that in that moment. So saying, actually, I'm feeling like you're not listening to me or you haven't heard what I'm trying to say. Can I explain it again? And I think it's a really good moment because those moments mean that they have an understanding of how you've felt and then you can work together to mediate and, you know, build that back up. And it might be like, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Can you explain it to me again? I'd like to listen. And so this is where it's incre incredibly important to be so transparent about how you're feeling and your experience is because it then provides the opportunity for the expectations of one another to match. They may not always, but until one another knows what you need, including your personal life as well as your healthcare team, it really needs that to give the opportunity to see what's forward. The other person is your GP. Um, we don't talk about the role of your GP enough, I think, at times. And they're a really great touch point. Don't lose them when you're in that specialist acute hospital. It's still very important to have them as part of your care. Book a long appointment in and sit down and just talk about what's going on and who, which doctors you've seen or if you're unsure about something. Ask how they can support you in your journey. What do you need from me? How often do you think I should be touching base with you? Um, if I was unwell, can we do telehealth? All of those things give you a really good understanding about how to move forward um, and have an understanding of what they can provide to you. And it then kind of helps you put the puzzle pieces together. So if this is happening for me, I know this is the person to go to. Or actually, if I'm uncertain about this, the GP said I could pop over and have a chat and sit down and talk through it. Those are the things that they're there to support you with. Now it's time to get practical because I think that's a huge component of what we do is that it affects every part of your life and the basic needs of what we have. So our family, our employment and our income, which is normally intertied, your accommodation, your accessing to treatment and what that looks like, your treatment decisions and also any prior plans you had. So I guess touching on each of those points a little bit further is that family. You might have dependent children that you're still looking after you might have relatives that you care for. You might have you know, most of your families overseas and so you don't have them, but you were planning to go over and see them and what does that look like? With your employment, employment's a really hard thing because it's a necessity to often intertwine with our income and our security to access food and, you know, um, our mortgage and our rent and things like that. So having a discussion with your employer early on when you feel comfortable, of course, is important to kind of get a better understanding. Know how much leave balances you have. Understand if they will give you leave without pay. Will they let you work remotely? Can you work reduced hours? It's a conversation that I would always recommend having earlier in the journey before it's necessarily needed so you know where you're at. Income. So income's this big thing. So if you have paid leave and things like that and you know for the next, say, 12 weeks you've got enough income coming in matching and but after those 12 weeks you don't have anything and it's unlikely you'll return to work, then there's lots of other avenues to look at. You could look into your super and what's available through that. You could look into your Centrelink. You could access different financial advisors and supports as required and see what they could also provide. Accommodation is the house, it's the mortgage, it's the rent and as intertwined with all of the income and the money, it can have huge ramifications on your ability to consistently pay those things. Sometimes it means that you need to talk with your bank, sometimes it means you talk to your real estate agent and I feel like in, in the past it's brought a significant amount of worry about what's to come where, when they find out those things. So I think talking through maybe with someone else before you take the steps to notify them or have a plan in place is a good idea where to start. So maybe talking to financial advisors or other supports or, you know, your job and things like that to see what's available. 
accessing treatment. So I know that everyone's from a far reaches of around Australia and I'm not sure which corners, but if you're a person that doesn't live within your health district and you have to travel a substantial amount, which is normally about 100 kilometres um, in each of the states, there's different things that are going to be challenging for you to access your treatment. Practical things like you're going to be away from your home, you're going to be away from your support network, you're going to need to travel. How are you going to get there? What's the transport? Where are you going to stay if you're not an inpatient? Where can you go? Is there any financial reimbursement? So I should say that every state and territory in Australia has, ours is called IPTA, so an isolated patient scheme, but they have a scheme for patients who live over 100 kilometres away from where they have to receive their specialist treatment. So if you're one of those people, I would recommend talking with either a social worker or flagging with the team to get access to support. They're often things that need to be done maybe before you travel. They can sometimes be done afterwards. The other thing is getting a bit of better knowledge about what accommodations available, what hospital accommodations, what's the proximity, where can I park? It's all those very basic practical things, but also can have a huge amount of added stress when it all feels like you don't really understand where you're at, where you can park and all those things. Outside of that, it can also be very financially burdensome and you'd have to really consider, you know, what you're able to do with your means, especially if you're not working. The other thing is, you know, processing and understanding your treatment decisions. So every time you see a specialist, you're going to be given a variety of options or talk through different things. And often it's time to kind of connect of if I follow this pathway, these are the things I'll need to consider. And it links back to, will I need to travel? What will that look like? How will I do that? And I think it's really good once you identify that there are some of those worries coming up and those barriers, it's about accessing support through your healthcare team, seeing who can help you do those. Um, and the other thing is any prior plans. A lot of people have holidays or trips or gatherings or they've got their daughter's wedding or you know, things like that. So acknowledging that those things are still booked in and what that may look like. I guess talking a bit more broadly is about the strategies. So my thing is start with your basic needs, your income, your accommodation, your mortgage or your rent or your household bills, um, you know, and your family and your employment are normally the ones that are the first ones to address because they're the ones that have ramifications onto others. I would say we can say that you can have multitude of those areas and if there's five that are hard, set one task a day or a week depending on what you feel able to do. And it might mean writing a list and prioritising one to ten with one being the most important to get sorted and ten being the last. The next thing is delegate. I know it's really difficult and you worry that it might impact on others and what that may look like but you can't do it alone. It's extremely challenging to do it alone and there will be times where you have to lean on others. It might mean that, you know, if your son's playing football every Saturday and that's really important to him, you might need to ask a friend to support the transport of that because you're doing something else. The other thing is keep a diary and a notebook. And it's not just about putting the tasks in, but it's also talking about the appointments, what the actions of the appointments were. Did I get given a referral to a service? What was that service? oh, actually today I had really bad pain and, you know, this is what uh, happened or today I felt this particular way and I was worried. And when you go to each appointment, take that diary or that notebook with you and you can sit down and say, actually, over the last two weeks I've had really bad pain, you know, eight out of the 14 days and it was when I was got up and did the shower. So having that is really important because it also offloads an incredible amount of the mental load that you're holding. It means that you have something tangible and once it's written down, you know it's there. The other thing is asking for help. So all of these things can be supported and mediated in some way. And you're not going to be the expert on every referral pathway or where you can get support and it's often about having a conversation and understanding. The other thing is it will never not be messy. <laughs> it will always feel messy it will always feel like there's something that hasn't your ducks will never fully be in a row and I think sometimes it's really important to kind of acknowledge that that's just the state it may be and it might not be forever but in this moment because of everything going on and everything that's out of your control it's going to be messy and feel very messy it doesn't mean it is chaotic or it's out of control it just means that it's not how it was before and I think that's often the hardest part to transition along the way. Community. 
this is this is the really hard one. I think it's about when you when you get diagnosed with cancer, you keep it in your small group, in your circle of your close family, your friends and your supports. But you're part of broader communities like your workplace or, you know, the football club or, you know, a multitude of different parts or the book club and things like that or your friend groups. And I think before you take the step out to share that information with others, it's about reflecting about what you need from that. So if you're a person, and I'm going to come back to those coping strategies, if you're a person that finds support in that social way and talking with others, you might be someone that really wants to engage your community and tell them so they can be present and they can understand what's going on and offer support as required. If you're a person that likes to be, you know, very private and process internally and in yourself, you might want to put boundaries into place about how much of the community is let in at a time. And it can be something that happens over time as well. It doesn't all need to happen at once. So it's about checking in is how much of the community do I want? Will this be helpful to have a lot of people involved? And once you answer that and see where you're at, you can then consider the next. What is the level of privacy you'd like? Do you want everyone updated about where you are at your treatment? Do you want everyone updated about the decisions that you're making? Do you want to be sharing that information or would you like to just keep that private with your inner group that you've chosen? The other thing is boundaries. People will love to text and ask how you are and talk about things. And sometimes it's really important, especially for your friends, is to have a conversation where you're not talking about cancer and you're not talking about how you're feeling. And some days it would be really helpful just to say, I don't want to talk about cancer today. I actually just want to really hear about the movie that you went and saw or I want to hear about how, you know, the kids are going or let's just talk about some silly reality television that we watched and let me have a moment out of that. And that's a boundary saying what you need in that time. The other thing is containing. So I sometimes recommend if there's an inner circle of people that you'd like to be part and you want them to all have access to the same amount of information, it's creating a group chat. It's creating a WhatsApp where you can, you or someone that you delegate to can provide that information in a contained way. So you're not repeating yourself each time. So coming back to the strategies, and I've already touched upon them, I got a little ahead of myself. It's about identifying first what you need and what is going to be of help and useful to you. Um, the next thing is creating that group chat. There's also many incredible apps and Pankind has the Many Hands app where you can actually also delegate that, which is marvellous, but you can put out a call to your community and your people about what support you need. There's also the ability to look at when you have appointments. So if you need access to support with transport or things like that, you have that available to you. So there's many great things you can use. The other things delegate, I think I've probably written that 10 times throughout this presentation because you can't always do it on your own and delegating is a really important part of it. The other thing is give tasks. So sometimes our friends feel incredibly helpful, helpless and our community feels helpless and they're not sure about what they can do. And sometimes giving people a task makes them feel like they're contributing or they're being present in a way. So something as simple as creating a playlist that you can listen to as you're receiving treatment or if you're in hospital and they can add songs to it is a really simple way of kind of, you know, them having, feeling like they're supporting you, you knowing that they're thinking and they're caring of you, but it's little tasks that you can do to work together. The playlist is always good. You'll get a surprise the amount of songs you get. <laughs> the other thing is faith and spirituality. So I don't think we always bring it up enough and I have found it something really important. But, you know, at the beginning of this, is faith or a religion something that's really important to you? Have, you know, and having an understanding of how your faith may be um, supporting your adjustment to your illness or how you're processing it. The other thing is that if you're, if you've got an incredibly strong faith, sometimes the best person to speak to, not always is the social worker it might be someone who's able to talk you through how your faith interconnects with what your experience is in that moment so reaching out to your faith leader whether you're a catholic and that's a priest that you've been going to for many years and you trust them and you want to have those discussions it's really important to reach out to those people seeking what you need the other thing is have you told your doctors if there's a religion or a faith that's really important to you then make sure that your team's aware of it um the other thing is what 
do you think the doctors need to know about your religion? Do you do they just need to know that you're Catholic and you attend the local church and that's part of your community and that's all you need to know of them? The other thing is if there's any particular practices that you would like respected over time. So if you're an inpatient on the ward, if it's important for you that the hospital, um, you know, Anglican minister comes or the priest or the chaplain or, you know, whoever your faith-based person is, if that's important for you to have in your admission, then that's something for the team to know and talk about. Okay, this is the big thing, life course. And when we talk about a diagnosis of cancer and especially pancreatic cancer, we, prior to that moment, you have mapped out what you perceived your life to be. You're going to work incredibly hard to this point and then you're going to retire at this point and you're going to go to Spain and tour for three weeks and then you're going to come back or actually I can't wait to see that my son and my daughter have families of their own and that's what I want to see. So when you get diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, all that shifts. I think in the initial way, all of that is felt is lost. So it comes down to this sense of what this ambiguous loss is. And it's about feeling this sense of grieving um, about what you lost or the dreams and the hopes and the aspirations of what you perceived your life to be. And it doesn't mean they're gone, but life without cancer and that dream is gone in a similar way and you will go through a process of grieving that and that uncertainty of now what does the future look like for myself so I think it's really important to validate those feelings if you're feeling that those milestones that were so important to you have feel lost it's about saying them out loud you know don't have any expectations or how you should feel sometimes people say they feel silly because you know it was just a thought it wasn't a concrete plan well it was. It was something you were working towards. It was a goal of yours. You dreamed about it. You imagined it. You could probably tell me, you know, what you would wear as you got off the plane or, you know, what you were going to do your first week of retirement. So it's about validating that those things are very real. And although they're not tangible in the same way as other things, they are to you. It's about saying them out loud and saying, well, I had this plan and I feel like it's gone. And what does that mean? Um, and it's then shifting and saying, well, how does that plan adjust? Because time has this very different meaning than it did previously because with time, you know, we took for granted before. We worked really hard. We didn't prioritize what was important to us. So now in the context of everything changing so rapidly, it's about shifting about, well, what's the most important thing to me and how can I change or adapt that to make it possible or how can I make it feel in a way that, you know, I can do other things? I wanted to bring in the concept of parallel planning. And I think this is a really challenging part of your care is that sense of hope and what that looks like. And often what they introduce in your health is planning for both. So planning for everything going great and then planning that maybe your symptoms might go astray and what does that look like and where we can access support. When we talk about those things as jarring as confronting it at the time, it again comes back to that provides direct and transparent communication. It gives you a space to voice what your fears are, what your worries are, and it allows the team to mediate those by maybe talking about what supports and services will be available at different times. It reduces the crisis. And I would say crisis is a really terrible place to be because that's when you often feel so helpless and uncertain about what the next steps are and what's going on. So having conversations about parallel planning means that in the back of your mind, you have a certain grasp of what's available to support you during those things. It also ensures that your wishes are followed. And I think that's the most important thing. No one writes what your wishes are. No one writes what means something to you or how you would like to be treated or what's important. And so it's really important that you have those open conversations about what's significant to you. And finally, um, just touching on palliative care. I would say feedback from patients is that it's often introduced into their care and it can be quite jarring and scary because it hasn't necessarily given much context about what palliative care is because if we see it in a TV show or we see it, we have our own grasp of what it is. But it's actually a really diverse, you know, support service that it opens access to many different services, allied health, nursing, community sports and inpatient supports. So what I would say in that moment when it's brought up in your care is asking the referring doctor. Don't be wondering about, you know, why did they do this? Is this what it means? Is this what they meant? Is this what they're thinking at the time? Ask. 
ask why the referral is being made. Say, if you're terrified, say you're really scared, like I'm worried about this. Um, and also voice what those thoughts are running in your head. And they might be some really scary things to say out loud, but it's important that you can have that conversation with your doctor and they can either provide further information or reassurance and talk about different things with you. The other thing is with the palliative care team is talking about what you are feeling. If your blood pressure and you were stressing and you were so worried and you had that pit in your stomach coming into the appointment that today, say, I'm really scared to be here. I'm terrified. I don't know if you didn't know why the referral was made. Say, I don't know why the referral was made. I'm not sure about this. Talk about what your goals are. And I think sometimes this is a bit of a shift in our conversations that we have with our healthcare team. So talk about actually my goal is that I really wanted to do a cruise or I actually just wanted to get down to Kayama to visit my sister, but actually I'm really nauseous at the moment and that's stopping me from doing that. That's how they want to hear what's going on for you. So the other thing is, you know, ask about what el who else is part of the team. Is there community? Is there allied health? Can I have access to them? How do I refer to them? Things like that. And also tell them, like with your other health care providers, communicate how you would like to be communicated with. So if you're someone who, when a really confronting topic or a hard topic, say about advanced care planning or things like that, if you're someone that likes to be resourced, go home, think about it and discuss it at the next appointment, tell them that. Tell them it sometimes takes me to process things. I find it really hard. So if it's something hard we have to talk about, I'd like the information to be prepared to talk about at the next appointment. I don't like being surprised. Having those things means that you have an expectation, they have an expectation about what you need and hopefully they match a little bit better. It also means that they're meeting what your communication is as well. And finally, sorry, I'm mindful of the time, everyone, is talking about the change of plan. So I spoke before about your life course and about all the things that you'd planned in the future that you were all working towards incredibly hard. Well, it's time to change the plan. And sitting down with a person, no matter what stage you are at, part of the journey you're at, it's sitting down and I often say get, you know, your support person or your partner or whoever, your family to also write theirs. But write down five ways that you enjoy spending time in this moment. It's not about going back before pancreatic cancer, but this moment with the things that you're able to do, what are the five things you enjoy and look forward to? The other thing is write down the five things you want to do. Now, I should say when I started here, I always thought everyone would want to go to Paris and climb the Eiffel Tower. But no, I've had people that wanted to go on a fishing trip. I had one person that wanted to go get lunch at the fish markets and that was really important to them. So writing down a list of the five things that you'd like to do that you want to prioritise in that moment. The other things is write down the three ways you've changed since your diagnosis. And when you're writing these, be really mindful not to write symptoms. I want you to write qualities of who you are. So actually, I'm amazed, like three qualities we have changed, like I'm amazed I was brave enough to, you know, get those needles or I was amazed that I did this or I was surprised I could do these things or I felt brave or I felt resilient in this way. Don't write symptoms, write qualities about who you are as a person. The other way is giving away advice and your plan to someone else. If your plan was to really climb Mount Everest or do a massive road trip and, you know, get a caravan and drive around Australia and go to all these towns and that's not something that you're able to do anymore, um, then I think it's a really good way of sharing that part about I would love to gift you this and don't waste time and do this and write it all out and have that and have that part of, you know, sharing what that is. The other thing is book it in, book in what you need to do. If the plan needs to change, if you do want a holiday, make sure you get appropriate travel insurances so you can cancel and you can get your money back. If it's tickets to the movies and you wake up and it's $15 and it's okay and you could do that, lose that $15 and it wouldn't have huge ramifications, then definitely do that. Um, the other one is talking to your healthcare teams about what your goals are and your plans are and working towards those goals. So say if you've got that nausea, as I provided that example before, tell them, say, I need your help because this is what I'd like to work towards. What can we do? And it's all about having those communications so they know how to best support you throughout what your needs are. And finally, I think hopefully that's most of you and you found some beneficial information in it. But does anyone have any questions? And I might hand back over to Sophia to help navigate um, the questions. 
Hi there. Thank you so much, Shannon. That was just amazing. And we do have one question that's come through. Um, they've asked, they, they said they've spoken to their GP and they felt overwhelmed and maybe lost because um, they wanted to get a referral to speak to somebody. Um, mm -hmm. But to do that, they needed to do the seven seven step test on depression, but they don't really seem mm -hmm. to be depressed. And they find mm -hmm. that talking to family doesn't work for some things. And they've mm -hmm. looked into online support groups, but there was wonder they were they were looking for um, any information about if there's some way that they can access a way to find some relaxation. And I don't know if, if that perhaps means they're looking for a way to speak to somebody, maybe that is a psychologist or a social worker, I guess, yeah. to help them feel um, supported in in the things that they need to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm just, I'll speak a little bit generally to that point. Um, I think the first thing that you've identified is like there's definitely is talks and topics that are really important not to have with your family and to have that private space to disclose them. Um, I think when it comes to cancer and how that intertwines, there is a lot of supports often available through your inpatient or your hospital team. So I would say if you felt that you weren't scoring or what the GP was screening wasn't matching how you were feeling, I'd raise those same feelings with your specialist team to say, is there any access of supports? When it comes to different relaxation techniques, um, there's ones available and I think it's hard to speak specifically just because I don't know um, yourself, but there is resources through many of the different cancer services you can look up. There's different mindfulness exercises. Um, some can be more meditation or breathing or things like that. And there's definitely apps like Calm and other things like that that's not necessarily cancer-related that can provide that support. But my feeling is if you've identified that sense in your health self, it's really important to seek that support firstly from your team. So I definitely would be going to your inpatient team so you could possibly have access to a social worker or a psychologist that can kind of talk through in a bit more detail about what your needs are. So um, it could be that you're a person that doesn't like to verbalise how you're feeling but you might like to journal. So they can, you know, talk about particular strategies that more be, might be more applicable to yourself. Thank you. That's really helpful. And um, I don't know if we have any more questions. I might just leave it open for, for a couple more minutes just to see if there's anybody. But, um, yeah, in the meantime, I did want to just say thank you for all of the examples and, and all of the information that you've gone through I think is incredibly helpful and, and a really amazing prompt, you know, to think through a whole lot of different elements and also to, to action a lot of those things as well and have strategies to move forward. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I would I know I've provided a lot of advice, but if you feel like you're unsure of how to communicate at any times, so I definitely think it's about kind of saying at that time, I'm not sure how to tell you or express to you. So it's it's just always being really open and, you know, clear about what your needs are because that's what you need to be sharing with your team and your family. Yeah, brilliant. Well, we haven't got any more questions at the moment. Um, but one thing I would like to just touch on before the end is just to let people know about a study that's happening nationally. It's a it's a clinical trial called Process, and it's looking to um, understand whether talking to a trained nurse counsellor via video or phone is helpful. So if um, anyone is a caregiver that's attended the webinar today and they'd like to know more about that, the email address and the phone number for the process trial team are available on the screen at the moment. And in that time, we have had another question come through um, and it's just asking how they would get in touch with the palliative care unit. Yeah, yeah. So I might speak from a New South Wales perspective because I'm not sure if it crosses all states, um, but there's two different avenues. So you can definitely speak to whoever you're, is your cancer specialist at that time, whether surgical or medical. Um, you can ask them to be referred to the palliative care team and explain a little bit maybe more about what you'd like that. Also, referrals can go to the palliative care team from your GP. So that is another person that you can talk to and say, like, I'm feeling ready. I'd like to touch base with the palliative care team. Can you put a referral in my behalf? And I think often the medical team themselves are a bit apprehensive to bring it up. So if you're prepared and that's something that you're seeking, definitely let them know. Great. Um, well, we've finished just on time tonight, so that's incredible. 
And um, yeah, if, if anybody has any more questions um, for us or that we, you know, if you'd like to ask Shannon, um, we're happy to pass those on to her. You can email us at info at and we'll um, help you out with any information you need or pass them along to Shannon if that's um, who you're asking the question of. Um, yeah, so finally, I'd just like to again say thank you so much, Shannon, for presenting tonight. Really, really appreciate it. And um, thank you, everybody who's attended as well. And uh, yeah, hopefully we see you soon. Yeah, thanks for your time, everyone. Thank you.